The Condensation of Florence Nightingale by Cecile Woodham Smith God bless Miss Nightingale. May she be free from strife. These are the prayers of the poor soldier's wife. Thus ran a popular English song of 1855, and indeed, to thousands of sick and wounded British soldiers in the Crimean War, Florence Nightingale was their symbol of hope, their ministering lady with the lamp. Yet, the lives she saved and the revolution in health care she began during that war were only part of the contribution she made to medicine. A woman who could be both charming and ruthlessly demanding, she reformed nursing and made it a respectable profession, radically changed hospital administration, and struggled to improve the wretched condition of the British soldier. All her life, in fact, she had to struggle. First, against her Victorian family who did not share her dedication to her cause, and later, against the politicians and medical authorities who lacked the vision to support her pioneering work. Florence Nightingale comes to life in these pages. A woman of character ruled by compassion, unafraid to challenge the accepted cruelties of a man's world. Chapter 1. It was something new to call a girl Florence. Within fifty years, thousands of girls all over the world would be christened Florence in honor of this baby, but in the summer of 1820, when Fanny Nightingale fixed on the name for her daughter, it was new. Novelty was the fashion in 1820. Europe was still rejoicing in the liberty which followed the Napoleonic Wars. Freedom to travel had returned, and Europe was thronged with travelers. Fanny and William Edward Nightingale had been traveling in Europe since their marriage in 1818. They already had one daughter, born in Naples in 1819, and christened by the Greek name for her place, Parthenope. For her second confinement, Fanny chose the city of Florence. When a second girl was born there on May 12, 1820, Fanny decided she too should be named after her birthplace. Fanny N. W. E. N., or Wen, as he was always called, Though both handsome and intelligent, were not a well-matched couple. Fanny was six years older than Wen. In 1820, she was 32, extremely beautiful, generous and extravagant, indefatigable in the pursuit of pleasure. In the art of making people comfortable, in the arrangement of a house, the production of good dinners, she possessed genius. She came from a remarkable family. Her grandfather, Samuel Smith, had been celebrated for the riches he had amassed as a merchant, and for his humanitarian principles. His son William, Fanny's father, devoted his wealth to collecting pictures and fighting for the weak, the unpopular and the oppressed. In the House of Commons, where he sat for 46 years, he was a leading abolitionist, championed the sweated factory workers, and battled for the rights of dissenters and Jews. His children did not inherit his altruism. There were five sons and five daughters, all good-looking, with immense zest for living and amazing health. We Smiths never thought of anything all day long but our own ease and pleasure, Fanny wrote 50 years later. Fanny was the beauty of the family, yet Fanny did not marry. In 1816, she fell in love with the Honorable James Sinclair, a younger son of the Earl of Catness. His character was allowed to be good and his intentions disinterested, but he possessed no income beyond the pay of a captain in the Russia militia. In letters full of kindness and unanswerable common sense, William Smith pointed out the absurdity of a, woman's, a woman of Fanny's habits contemplating life on an income of scarcely 400 a year and declined in justice to his other children, to assume the support of her future family. Fanny pleaded in vain that her affections were entirely given away, but by 1817 the affair was at an end. Fanny was now nearly 30, and William Edward Nightingale was nearly 24. She had known him since he had been an awkward, lanky schoolboy, immensely tall, immensely thin, with a habit of always standing upright, propped against mantelpieces and doors because he disliked folding himself into a chair. At 21, he had come into a fortune left him by his uncle, and had gone up to Cambridge. There he proved, though lazy, to be clever. He gained a reputation for wit. His height and remote gentle manners gave him distinction. In 1817, Wen became engaged to Fanny. He was very much in love. Fanny's rich beauty warmed his reserved temperament, and for a short time he thawed. The period was brief. Normally, as Fanny wrote later, Mr. Nightingale is seldom in the melting mood. Fanny's family did not approve of the engagement. They were fond of Wen, but they had no faith in his character. He was clever, but he was indolent, hated making up his mind, hated taking action. He was not the husband for Fanny. Within six months, however, they were married and had gone abroad. Fanny believed she would be able to mold Wen. She intended him to become one of the prosperous, cultivated, and liberal-minded country gentlemen who played an important part in English public life. They would have a beautiful house, a fine library, maintain an interest in the arts, and entertain. After nearly three years abroad, Fanny began to feel it was time they came home, and in 1821, when Florence was a year old, the Nightingales left Italy, accompanied by maids, footmen, valet, coachman, and cook. Wen had made a quick trip to England to have work started on a new house of his own design. 
he gave it a vaguely gothic air and called it Leia Hurst. But no sooner was it finished than Fanny realized that Leia Hurst was inadequate. The only attraction was its wonderful view. The situation was inaccessible, the house cold. Above all, it was too small a house in which to entertain. Fanny's standards uh, of accommodation descended to her daughter. Twenty years later, at a dinner party, Florence denied that Leia Hurst was anything but a small house. Why, she said, it has only fifteen bedrooms. In 1825, therefore, Wen bought Embley Park, near Romsey in Hampshire. It was a good-sized square house of the late Georgian period. London was reasonably near, and Fanny would be within easy reach of her two married sisters, Mrs. Nicholson at Waverley Abbey and Mrs. Bonham Carter at Fair Oaks near Winchester. By the time Florence was five, the pattern of the Nightingale's life was fixed. Summer at Leahurst, the rest of the year at Embley Park, visits to London in spring and autumn. Wen proceeded to turn himself into an English country gentleman. He shot, fished, hunted, did a great deal for his tenants, and took part in local politics. Fanny looked forward to the day when he would stand for Parliament. Fanny's life went smoothly. The only shadow was cast by Florence, called Flo, as Parthenope was Partha or Pop. She promised to grow up more than ordinarily good-looking. She was lightly built, singularly graceful, with thick, bright chestnut hair and a delicate complexion. But she was not an easy child. Both Fanny and Wen loved children. A stream of cousins spent their holidays at Embley and Leah Hurst, and almost invariably, Fanny had a couple of family babies in the house. Kiss all babies for me is a frequent ending to the first letters Flo wrote home when she was sent to stay with the relatives. Flo's childhood was filled with gardens to play in, ponies to ride, and a succession of dogs, cats, and birds to be looked after. Yet she was not happy. If she had been an ordinary naughty child, Fanny would have understood her, but she was not naughty. She was strange, passionate, obstinate, and miserable. She had an obsession that she was not like other people, that she was some sort of monster. She was afraid of meeting strangers, especially children, lest they discover her secret. She doubted her capacity to behave like other people, and refused to dine downstairs, convinced she would betray herself by doing something extraordinary with her knife and fork. At first, she was overwhelmed with terror and guilt at the gulf which separated her from everyone around her. Surely she ought to be like everyone else. But almost before she had grown out of babyhood, guilt and terror were succeeded by discontent. Miss Nightingale recorded that as early as the age of six, she was aware that the rich, smooth life of Embley and Leah Hurst was distasteful to her. She began, like many imaginative children, to escape into a dream world, to tell, her, to, to tell herself stories in which she played the heroine. Though she shrank from meeting people, she was not self-sufficient. She was a child who craved sympathy and attached herself with vehemence to anyone whom she felt to be sympathetic. Her childhood was a series of passions, for her governess, Miss Christie, for Wen's younger sister, Aunt May, for a beautiful older cousin. When the governess left and when Aunt May married, the violence of Florence's feelings made her physically ill. She did not attach herself to her mother. As a child, she was a copious letter writer, and her letters show her consciousness of a want of sympathy in Fanny. When she writes to others, her pen flies on, with total disregard of spelling, telling them of the adventures of Nelson the dog, of a local suicide, a good crop of apples, and Aunt May's new baby. Aunt May calls her new baby the thing. Don't you think that is very disrespectful? Writing to Fanny, the flow is checked. Her letters are formal and short. She assures her mother that she is wearing the boots to strengthen her ankles. She is endeavoring to improve her spelling. She is trying to be more good-natured. The companion of her childhood was her father. When was a man to enchant a child? He loved the curious and the odd, and he loved jokes. He had a mind stored with information and the leisure to impart it. He was a lonely man, and it was with intense pleasure he discovered companionship in his daughters. Both were quick, both learned easily, but the more intelligent, just as she was the prettier, was Flo. It was a difficult situation for Partha, the, old, the elder. Flo, strange, passionate, uncomfortable little thing, had something about her which struck people as exceptional. Flo led, and Partha followed resentfully. Partha was possessive towards Flo. She adored Flo, but she was bitterly envious. In 1830, Flo wrote to Partha from Fair Oaks, Pray, dear Pop, let us love each other better than we have done. It is the will of God, and Mama particularly desires it. Wen's plan for their education brought about the final division between the girls. In 1832, he determined to teach them himself. A governess was engaged for music and drawing, but the girls learned Greek, Latin, German, French, Italian, history, and philosophy from their father. Wen was exacting, and Partha rebelled. Florence and her father both had the same regard for accuracy, the same cast of mind at once humorous and gloomy, the same passion for abstract speculation. Partha resented their companionship, but she did not want to struggle with Greek verbs. 
While Florence was with Wen in the library, Partha would be busy with Fanny, arranging flowers, entertaining friends, writing innumerable letters to the vast Nightingale family's connections. On Florence's 14th birthday, Wen calculated she had already 27 first cousins, nearly two dozen aunts and uncles by blood and marriage. Fanny's brothers and sisters, the energetic, handsome Smiths, had the strongest possible family feelings. Not only major events, weddings, births, deaths, but the choice of a place for a holiday, the dismissal, dismissal of a cook, provoked correspondence with aunts, uncles, cousins, and grandmothers. To Florence, all this was an intolerable waste of time. I craved, she wrote, for some regular occupation, for something worth doing instead of frittering time away on useless trifles. To her, only three families were of, to her, only three families were of importance. The Nicholsons, the Bonham Carters, and the family of Aunt May, now Mrs. Sam Smith of Combehurst, Surrey. Aunt May was a person of importance to the Nightingales. She was Wen's sister, and should he have no son, the property he had inherited from an uncle would pass to her. In 1827, she had married Fanny's younger brother, Sam Smith. It was then seven years since the birth of Florence. Fanny was nearly 40, and there was no sign of another child. It was almost certain that if Aunt May had a son, he would eventually inherit Embley and Layhurst, and the marriage with Link, which linked the two families more closely together was welcomed. In 1831, a son was born, and Fanny behaved admirably. The situation was not easy for her. Not only was Aunt May mother of the heir, she was also the object of Florence's extravagant devotion. Nevertheless, Fanny's affectionate relations with Aunt May were unclouded. Aunt May's son was given a privileged position in the Nightingale family. When he was a few days old, he was laid in Florence's arms. My boy, Shore, the eleven-year-old Flo proudly called him. Devotion to Shore, pride in him, and Shore's devotion to her grew into one of the most important relationships in her life.